many of you will know that I had a career change some months ago. I went from being a full-time professor to doing uh, full-time work in investigations, a work that I've been doing part-time for several years now. And I focus on faith-based organization investigations. And actually, for the, the most part, what I'll be posting in the future on this channel, because it's been dormant a little bit for the last few months, is going to be in this area. And with that in mind, I'm really delighted to have Rachel Brown joining me for a discussion. Rachel is an investigative journalist and documentary producer who has written for Vice, McLean's, CBC, Texas Monthly, as well as a critically lauded bastion of Canadian journalism known as The Walrus. And it is with The Walrus earlier this year that she published a really important article titled The Meeting House Inside a Megachurch Scandal. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Randall. All right. Uh, so this is the story of Brexy Cavey uh, in part, but it's about more than him for sure. Uh, for those who don't know, I would kind of compare him to a Canadian Greg Boyd. And for those who don't know Greg Boyd, he's an American well-known high profile church pastor, author from the pacifist tradition who actually was, and maybe is good friends with Bruxy Cavey. Uh, so tell us about Bruxy and the meeting house. Uh, for starters, introduce who they are, and then we can go from there. Well, to start with the Meeting House, it's an evangelical megachurch that started um, in Oakville, Ontario, which is outside, just outside of Toronto, actually, where I grew up uh, more than 25 years ago. Um, in the early 2000s or so, it had become this really popular um, church, uh, especially in the Canadian and Ontario context. Uh, I think at its peak, it had more than 5,000 members, and there were 19 satellite locations across the province. And I think what's even more interesting is that at its peak, again, there were about 200 home churches. So people would gather in small groups, um, you know, before or after um, church to discuss Bruxy's sermons, the lead pastor there. So it was this really thriving community, both on like a large scale and then as well as on a micro scale where people would gather in very small groups in their in their homes um, as a way to talk about the sermons of the day. Um, it kind of looked like your typical mega church that you would think about, like you see in the U.S. It was um, the, the, the base of the church was in, in a movie theater and they would broadcast uh, live stream um, Bruxy's sermons to other satellite locations across the province. So they were really a pioneer in sort of the technological, um, uh, sort of the use of technology in the church to to export uh, the gospel and export Bruxy's sermons. And, you know, eventually the church kept growing and then they, they landed in this giant, um, nearly 40,000 square foot warehouse in Oakville and they still have that building. Um, and Bruxy himself was the lead teaching pastor there uh, since 1997. Um, the church had gone through a few iterations since then, but since 1997, um, he was at the helm of the church and the church really was built around him. He's this very kind of charismatic figure, but not so much in a fire and brimstone kind of uh, loud televangelist uh, uh, preacher that you would think of at a mega church. He was more subdued. Um, and so, you know, since then he led the led the mega, uh, led the meeting house and really um, became known around the world as I would say one of Canada's most popular evangelical pastors, popular megachurch leaders. He had a really strong rep reputation both here and in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, and also, of course, a, a couple of popular books he'd written. Uh, and when you said 5,000 people going to the meeting house, to some Americans, and my wife's Korean, to many Koreans, that wouldn't sound like that large a church. My wife's church uh, in Korea was 45 or 50,000 people. Exactly. But I mean, that would be probably the largest church in Canada at the time, right? One of them, for sure. I think there's a couple in, um, in Alberta that maybe surpassed that. But at the time, especially, and like I said, with that home church model, it was pretty significant in that regard. So what is the scandal with respect to Bruxy then? And, and when did that erupt on the public scene? It was at the end of, around the end of 2021, um, there was a, a woman who came forward who was a member of the congregation. Um, she'd actually spoken to the Toronto Star um, a few months later 
Um, she was one of the first, uh, the first woman who came forward um, to church leaders to say that she had began um, back years ago when she had started receiving pastoral counseling from Bruxy. Um, she was in her 20s at the time, so this was quite a few years ago. Um, and she alleges that their relationship um, became sexual in nature. Um, and she is now um, the person who is at the center of the criminal sexual assault case that Bruxy is facing. Um, so she's accused him of sexual assault and he's been charged with one count of sexual assault in that case. Um, and that sort of sparked these allegations of clergy sexual abuse on Bruxy's part. Um, and since she came forward, um, there were four other accusations of sexual abuse and misconduct against uh, Bruxy. Um, and that was at the time around 2021 into 2022, the church launched an internal investigation, uh, hiring a, um, an independent um, investigator, uh, actually a few different types of investigations um, to look into those claims. And they found that they were substantiated, um, but there's been no other criminal charges that have been pursued. Uh, since that one, the first woman came forward. Now, uh, as a Christian, I mean, I, I can see why this is a pretty important thing to talk about. Uh, but within Canada, uh, generally, I don't think religion gets many headlines, except probably with bad news. What drew you to, uh, as a journalist, to focus on this issue as it had arisen? So... You know, interestingly enough, uh, about 15 years ago in my teens, I attended the meeting house with my parents and my family. Um, as I mentioned off the top, I grew up in Oakville. So the meeting house was this really kind of exciting, um, new, interesting, unique church that was taking root in the early 2000s. And so my family, um, my parents were sort of interested in the Baptist evangelical uh, churches that were popping up in Oakville and, and in the GTA in the greater Toronto area. And so that was one of the churches that we attended. Um, you know, frankly speaking, it was something that I did not want to do. Personally, I wasn't um, really, uh, I, I wasn't in the faith. I still am not. Um, so this was something that I really kind of um, pushed back against. But um, because it was in a movie theater and it was kind of this cool dude uh, speaking in this really um, approachable way, um, sometimes crass ways, like he kind of pushed the boundaries. I thought it was a fun experience. So if I was going to go to church, I was always kind of pushing for the meeting house. And so when I heard the news that there had been these accusations against uh, Bruxy, I, I think I saw it on Twitter the first time I saw it and that there had been this internal investigation launched. I was struck not only because of it being a late, the latest allegation of a of sexual misconduct and abuse against a church leader, but because I had known and seen Bruxy and the Meaning House growing up, so it was personal for me, um, and I knew that I I I knew there'd be more to the story, um, so I just sort of delved into it. All right, that's really interesting. So, uh, was it just Bruxy? Uh, I guess I want to we'll put it like this, that, uh, and I'm not comparing pastors to mice, but I am saying that if I catch one mouse in the house, there's probably more than one. And if you've got a really large institution often, and you have like one very important person who is engaging in this kind of behavior, which on the face of it looks predatory, maybe it's, maybe there's more of a systemic problem within the organization and it's not just the one. So was it just Bruxy or was this a wider problem within the meeting house? So as the stories about Bruxy and, you know, news reports came out and more people um, from the church started posting about it on social media, the scope of the internal investigation um, then started focusing on allegations of misconduct and abuse against two other um, leaders at the meeting house, um, one of whom was a worship leader who had been on a contract, I believe. And then there was another uh, man named Tim Day, who was sort of Bruxy's right hand uh, man at the time. He also faced um, allegations. Again, there's been no criminal charges pursued in either of those cases. But 
um, I started to see people talk about this online, especially young people who are about my age and in their teen years when they were attending the church in the mid early to mid 2000s. And they were saying, you know, they were mentioning these youth pastors who had faced accusations of sexual abuse and sexual assault. Um, I hadn't heard of this before. And upon speaking with more people and digging into court records and um, looking into this, I found that dating back uh, at least to the mid 2000s, around 2005, um, there was one youth pastor named Kira Naidu who was charged with um, several counts of sexual assaults um, involving young girls who were in the youth group at the time. And I attended the youth group as well. Um, I, I, I didn't see or experience any of this, but it was sort of jarring to see um, and learn about experiences that peers that were there at my time were, were undergoing this. So he was charged and eventually convicted with um, sexual assault, um, sexual assault against a number of um, underage girls who were attending the meeting house at the youth group. Um, and that uh, discussions about that had kind of floated around and sort of informal ways in the church throughout the years but there are a lot of people there at the time say that it wasn't communicated properly to parents it wasn't communicated properly to the broader church body that there had been this youth pastor who was known to be a predator and had been uh, removed from the church and so that was surprising to me and shocking and then I, I learned later that a few years later a similar thing happened where another youth pastor who came on um, his name's uh, Churchill, Pastor Churchill came in as a youth leader and same thing um, on a lesser scale, but he was faced and convicted with um, a sexual assault charge involving an underage girl at the youth group. Um, and no one had kind of put out in public a big connecting of these dots. And it was clear that there was um, knowledge of course, that there was criminal proceedings and convictions against two youth pastors at the church. Um, but a lot of people who attended the church told me that they were dissatisfied that no one had really um, talked about those in a meaningful way to make the church body aware. Um, so that, that it just shows the sort of historic roots of, of abuse within the church, especially involving young women. Uh, I'm thinking of for a second of, of uh, Mark Driscoll and, and the Mars Hill Church and the, the really well done podcast, long form podcast, uh, I think Christianity Today did of the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Um, and within that context, it's pretty clear how the institution itself as it was built was prone to abuse of the members. And I'm wondering um, when you look at the meeting house and you see what appears to be a pattern emerging in terms of the and I think you referred in the article to like a sexualized culture um, and how you have these youth leaders, at least these two, Tim Day, uh, Bruxy and so on. Is Was there something about the way that the church was structured, the way that there were the, the institutional culture that had been built, which was enabling these people to engage in what appears to be this predatory behavior? I think so. Um... I think we can look to a number of things that perhaps can contribute to what people have described as a sexualized environment or a place where kind of pushing those boundaries, especially in the early 2000s, um, was normalized. And so there was a lot of talk among youth pastors and even Bruxy himself in some sermons, um, like very candid discussions about sex, almost, um, talking about it in joking terms. So, you know, not to be kind of pearl clutchy about this, but it seemed even based on the discussions I was having with youth um, who are kind of reflecting on this, it was just sort of a place where people could um, speak in sexual terms about each other, about themselves, where it was kind of normalized to ask each other deeply personal questions about sex and sexual behaviors and talk about things that uh, things in the Bible to do with sex in sort of a, a mocking or um, irreverent way. And so um, I think there was also in general, this environment where they were seen as the, the church for people who aren't into church. Now that's not necessarily, of course, that's not saying this is 
anti-church or this is a place where things are immoral. But I think having them set up as a counterculture uh, sort of edgy place um, laid the foundation for, for perhaps people who, um, you know, felt comfortable pushing the boundaries to, to come in and be leaders. There was not also not a lot of oversight from what I can tell, especially in the early 2000s, um, if people had complaints about um, misconduct or things that made them feel uncomfortable. It was often swept under the rug, especially with these youth pastors. Um, they were often sort of dealt with on a very small scale hush hush kind of way. So I think there was sort of a culture of secrecy. I mean, the youth group itself was called the underground, um, which kind of, in, you know, evokes a, kind of a secret society or things that are shrouded from the parents or leadership. So little signals like that, I think, come together to form what ended up becoming a very problematic environment, especially for young people. Uh, when um, I think it was uh, March 8th of 2022, Bruxy posted an online statement. I think it was called My Confession. And as I read that statement, he framed it in my reading as, well, I, there's one person and it was an affair. <clears throat> it was a moral lapse. The fact that there have been legal charges laid suggests that other people are not persuaded by that narrative. From your perspective as a journalist who's who's looked into this, what is your sense? It's really hard to say because um, we're still before the, tri the trial. Um, the trial isn't scheduled until next year. Um, so we'll get a sense at that point when it's made public what the police and the prosecution has to support their sexual assault charge. Um, you know, they feel at least it, it signals that they feel like there's enough evidence there to obtain a, a, a conviction. Um, I'm not sh I, I, I'm not privy to what that is, and it would be under a publication ban at this point. But um, it will certainly be interesting to to see that back and forth between what Bruxy, as you said, described as an affair. Um, he denies that there's any criminal wrongdoing that he's um, undertaken. It'll be an interesting look at how the court deals with issues around um, power and abuse of power and as that relates to sexual assault allegations. Um, so we'll, it, it kind of remains to be seen what the evidence is and we'll know more next year. Uh, if I were to uh, reframe it a little bit, uh... So we have the possible, the possibility of a sexual assault on the one hand. We have a mutual consensual affair on the other. In in the middle between those two, we also have, uh, as you reference, a power differential of clergy sexual abuse, which may not meet a legal threshold of sexual assault, but which nonetheless is not a consensual affair, as as uh, Bruxy framed it. So setting up those two between clergy sexual abuse that is not necessarily qualified as a legal assault versus a fair, uh, do you have a perspective on that? It's it, again, it's hard to it's hard to say without without seeing the full extent of 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 each side. Um, but I think what is interesting if you look at Bruxy's post, which is now deleted. Um, he calls it my darkest sin, my greatest failure. He takes full responsibility for his actions. I don't know exactly what that means, but that's sort of interesting that he he sees it as a, the darkest sin, but yet it's not criminal. Um, and so again, this is sort of a really interesting and I think tricky and complex area that until we until we get a sense of how this plays out in the courts, it's it's really difficult to say, um, but there's obviously things that he, aspects of what this this woman has said that maybe he agrees with, but there's obviously a lot that he takes issue with too. Uh, when, when, when that, as I understand, she was about 23 when this started and he was double her age, about mid forties. And it was ostensibly within the context of a counseling relationship and the affair or, I mean, the encounters flowed out of that, is that correct? From what I understand from the Toronto Star, Star reporting, yes. Okay, okay. 
Um, you also say a fair bit about the megachurch institution more broadly. And I'm wondering why, uh, was it just for context or do you think that there's some unique problems or challenges that come with the institution of a megachurch often focused on a charismatic persona that is potentially linked with a higher risk factor to abuse or uh, why the focus on megachurch as such? I think it was important for us in this piece and, you know, in, in deep conversations with my editor on this story, um, you know, it was important to show that this is part of a larger picture. Um, having this story, you know, just focusing on this as an isolated incident is incorrect and doesn't do the whole issue justice unless we kind of, you know, show, which is the truth, that it's part of this constellation of accusations that we've seen for many, many years against various charismatic leaders, not just within um, mega churches, but um, the Catholic church and so forth. So I think it was important for us to, to contextualize this and to show, you know, what some people are saying, uh, experts have said that building around, whether it's religious, a religious institution or other, other types of institutions, building around a charismatic figure is problematic because the you know, on the one hand, the buck stops with this one person, but if that person is flawed, and we all are flawed, if that person is flawed, or if that person is perpetuating um, abuses or misconduct, then the whole institution um, can be shaken or disrupted or even broken to its core. So it's just something for, it's a valuable lesson, I think, not only for people who are attending churches or people who are um in these Christian circles, um, but it's sort of a, a broader lesson for for us all to to consider the ways in which we build ourselves and our communities around soul figures, um, which is what the meeting house had had done, um, and it's sort of um, dealing with the fallout today. I think you could place the meeting house on broadly what we might call left-wing evangelicalism or progressive evangelicalism culturally it shares a lot with the broader evangelical movement but theologically or doctrinally i think that they'd also be more progressive than a lot of especially american conservative evangelicalism and uh, there's been a lot of interesting writing and reporting in the last few years i think one of the most high profile books was called jesus and john wayne <clears throat> where the the author explores the degree to which there's been within broader evangelicalism a lot of things like sexual abuse of women and sexual harassment and so on and females and and others but that has gone on often under within a framework that is broadly patriarchal or misogynistic uh, not always uh, so we have some high profile examples like willow creek church in Chicago, where you had Bill Hybels, who was ostensibly an egalitarian pastor, who nonetheless appears to have engaged in some very questionable power differential relationships with females. Uh, did you see within the meeting house uh, anything that you would call a sort of latent misogyny or patriarchy, which could be part of the problem as, as these uh, abuses emerged? I think def definitely, um, you know, the fact that it's built around Bruxy, who is this, um, you know, white man, uh, cisgender man, um, in and of itself, you know, is not is not a, necessarily a problem, but it sets up that that potential that the reinforcement of patriarchy. Um, and then, you know, in my reporting, I spoke with a number of people who said that other um, other lead pastors, men, um, would often speak in derogatory and sexualized terms to women who were in the, in the worship, uh, band, you know, singers, um, and, and musicians, and they would speak in sort of sexualized ways and derogatory ways and harassing, uh, ways to them. And then the youth pastors, again, it was sort of built around these male youth pastors who, um, this has changed now, but at the time could be in 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 one-on-one -on -one spaces with underage girls providing um, 
counseling or, or pastoring to these young girls. And so I think that's a recipe for not only a power differential, but um, for people to abuse that power. Um, and if there's no checks and balances or people are, there's a culture where things are swept under the rug, then it's just a recipe for, for abuse. And so, um, yes, it, the reporting that I did showed that there were instances of misogyny and that there were instances of, of patriarchy and its absolute worst forms playing out there. Um, and I think with Danielle Strickland, who did come in for a short time as, as, uh, you know, a female leader, um, who is really seen as someone who is great for the church and could help it help steer it in a good direction. She's she left in the wake of these accusations, of course, in solidarity with the first woman who came forward. Um, you know, she is someone who had a lot of promise to help, um, I think, do good at the meeting house, but has now moved on. So eh, that's a long way of saying yes <laughs> to, to her question. No, well, it's a uh... I think uh, I really appreciate the nuance that you gave there, because again, I think often a, a patriarchy, misogyny, or hydra-headed, and so people think, well, it's the pastor who's, you know, he's a he's a complementarian. He believes women should stay in the home. That's what we have to look out for. That's the guy who's going to abuse women and girls, and you don't even realize the cool guy with the tattoo in his arm who says he fully is egalitarian. Galatians 3.28, you know, well-known egalitarian passage and so on, you don't realize that he can be engaging in predatory behaviors as well, which in my estimation is, is what uh, what I think Ruxy was doing. Uh, where's the meeting house at now? Because you said, like, this is a church that built itself largely around a charismatic personality you remove the charismatic personality, where does that leave the church at? Where does that leave the church at with respect to Bruxy, with respect to the survivors, and with respect to the church itself going forward as a viable institution? So since these accusations all you know, came forward and as the months went on, the church has been hemorrhaging money, it's been hemorrhaging members, um, people. And there's this like, even when I attended one of the town halls um, towards the end of 2022, there was a really stark divide between those who uh, were actually still loyal to Bruxy and those who weren't and felt like, um, and were still angry uh, that the church, in their opinion, hadn't gone far enough to, to hold him and other people accountable and to provide answers to the to the church body um, and to take meaningful reform. So there was it was really um, a rife time at the end of, of last year. And uh, my understanding is that at least one, if not more, churches, these satellite locations have shuttered, um, the finances are in turmoil. I don't know the specifics of it, but um, that's my understanding that, 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 you know, people have left the church in droves and um, there's been turnover in the interim leadership, kind of chaos on that front as well. So I don't really know. A lot of people speculated that the church could probably fold entirely very, very soon. Um, so I think unless they're able to really shore up the church body with a strong leadership that um that people can get behind i don't know really what the future holds for the, for the meeting house um and a lot of people are obviously watching what happens with this trial um very closely um to see to see what else will be um what else will come to light about the church's involvement or awareness of, of what was going on I, so how did the, the church uh, in terms of the survivor piece when these women came out, how did the church receive what they had to say? Because within much of Christianity, there's a long history of a, attacking the survivor. You've got categories like a Jezebel, very again, very misogynistic categories. So um, did they, obviously, I suppose, like with any large institution, the response to them was mixed. But could you characterize, was there an overall did, were people open to listening to them or was there a real attempt to stigmatize or silence them? They certainly felt that way. Um, but at the same time, there was, you know, a victim advocate who came in um, to support people that way. 
she um, has since resigned as well. Um, but there was definitely um, people who felt silenced and stigmatized. Um, and they are anonymous, but there's um, instances of especially the first woman who's at the center of the criminal case facing online harassment, um, being doxxed or outed, um, which is illegal per the publication ban at the, at the center of the criminal case. Um, so that was certainly something that was that was alarming to see, um, and it shows that people are basically willing to um, torment and harass people um, in sort of allegiance to a leader that they align themselves with. A couple more questions as as we begin to wrap up. Uh, one of them is when things like this happen. People often, you know, that they well, they listen to this guy's pastors for this this pastor's sermons for years. They read his books. You know, it's a large church, so they probably didn't have long conversations with him, but they brushed past him in the hallway and always found him to be charismatic and uh, an intriguing figure and so on, and they trusted him. And then this kind of thing breaks, and it's easy to say, well, was it all a lie? Was he just a charlatan and a predator? Uh, using this as a way to to cultivate and exploit uh, exploitive relationships with vulnerable women. Do you have any sense in terms of to the extent that you've learned about Brexy as a persona, how to understand him on this this grid from just a, a failed morally uh, errant person who made a mistake versus a heartless predator or something in between? Again, and, and I know this is not a satisfying answer, but there's just so there's so much that is unknown as well, um, and we'll know more in the trial. Um, so I think that by that time we can connect again and sort of look at what's being um, presented, and a lot will come to light, I'm sure, um, if this does proceed to trial, which it's it's supposed to. Um, in terms of whether it's all a, a lie um, or if this was sort of just a, a, a it's sort of a chicken and egg question is, is, is this the case where the, a church like this um, draws in people who are already um, prone to abuse power, prone to be predatory towards women or other people um, or are narcissistic? Is, is that sort of the nature of this type of church that it draws those people into leadership roles or does it turn people into those types of people um, when they arrive? there. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, we can look at a lot of examples where this plays out. I think it's a place where it can help um, sort of ignite those tendencies in people if, if, if the culture is not correct, if the culture is not one of accountability and openness and transparency, I think it can help, um, you know, bring out those, the worst tendencies in that regard among people, among leaders. So it, it's very difficult to say, I think there's a lot of people who would say that um, that that they've gained a lot, and that it's this the meeting house is a very important aspect of their life. Um, it's helped them. It's um, a place of community. And so, is that all a lie? I don't. I don't think so. Um, I think it depends on who you ask and how they've benefited from the meeting house in other ways. I know a lot of people haven't. A lot of people have felt that they've been betrayed. A lot of people felt like they've been um duped um and it's traumatic i mean you speak about the rise and fall of mars hill you, you hear this sentiment throughout that as well like it's very traumatic and hard and hurtful when people um basically give themselves over um and trust these places um that are supposed to be safe and and um good for you um so I think there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of healing that a lot of people are still kind of contending with. Um, so, the, you know, the impact is is immense. Well, I appreciate the nuance of your answer. Um, obviously, it is a, a complex and messy and morally ambiguous often situation. Uh, so I want to uh, encourage people to, I'm going to include a link to the article below in the show notes again the meeting house inside a mega church scandal i'm th i'm reminded of uh, the famous quote from um, martin luther king jr that the arc of history is long but it bends towards justice and i think uh, the work that you do is a little bit of that bending so i really appreciate it 
Uh, is, can you share us anything that you're working on now? Now I am working on a couple more pieces for the Walrus actually um, for next year. Um, so I'd be happy to share more details when those come to light. Um, one of which is is very uh, specific to Christianity and religion. The other is more uh, sort of along those same lines, but not as 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 literal. So um, working on a couple more investigations to come. Excellent. Well, uh, we really appreciate having you on today, Rachel. I, I do want to connect uh, about those in the future and also the, uh, I was going to say Ravi Zacharias trial. That's too much stuff in my head. The Brett <laughs> and Katie trial in February as that begins to unfold. So we'll look to connect with you again. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks, Randall. Thanks so much for having me and for the kind words. Thank you. You bet.